people. Welcome to a new episode of Psicoactivo. Uh, today we have a treat. Uh, I've been wanting to talk to Mr. Nick Cook for since I ever stumbled upon uh, one of his conversations online. He was speaking about consciousness, which is one of the topics that I talk about the most in my channel. Uh, Nick Cook is an author of the best-selling book, The Hunt for Zero Point. He's written more than 25 books in his career. And he's also won awards as a journalist, uh, defense journalist. Uh, I want to make it really clear of who you are for the people that uh, maybe are not so convinced of the whole uh, situation here, because um, you worked for uh, Jane's Defense uh, Weekly, which is one of the biggest publications on defense uh, journalism. You started working there in 1986, if I'm correct. That's correct. Yeah. And you have uh, direct communication and contact with pretty much all the big players who are currently treating the UFO phenomenon in a more serious man manner. Uh, people from academia, people from the scientific community, fellow journalists, and you are very, very much uh, familiar with everything that's going on. Uh, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say UFOs and UAP aren't my primary focus. Um, I am primarily focused on the whole consciousness question, which we can talk about, uh, which I know we are we are going to talk about, Pavel. Um, but yeah, I, I in order to maintain a sort of world's eye view over the whole consciousness discussion it has been necessary for me to involve myself to a degree in the uap uh situation the the uap discussion so i can talk a little bit about that as well another uh important thing to uh mention is the book you're currently writing which is called the light beyond the mount beyond the mountains and you have it on Substack uh, serialized. Is that correct? Yes, this is a new departure for me. I have, as you said, I've written about 25 books in my career, not all under my own name, because I'm a ghostwriter, as well as um, writing my own material. But uh, I have recently, so just at the end of 19, sorry, <laughs> the end of 2023, I embarked on a new venture, which is to publish this book, The, Mo the Light Beyond the Mountains, as a serialization. So every two weeks, I produce a chapter. Um, this is quite uh, challenging, as you can imagine, because I'm not, it's not a format that I'm used to, but it's enabling me to have an online conversation, which I'm very much enjoying. So uh, this is a new experience, but so far a very rewarding and gratifying one okay well uh that was the introduction so thank you for being with us in this in this program uh if that's okay with you i'm gonna start talking about the hunt for zero point uh it's very interesting to me that the whole journey you went through with this book uh, i don't want to spoil anything i'm going to leave uh uh links to everything that we've mentioned or we mentioned on this conversation in the description but I do want to get into uh, the investigation part of it, because I've heard you uh, mention in other interviews uh, that there was a lot of stigma uh, related to this whole topic of UFOs and anti-gravity and uh, different kind of propulsion uh, back when you were investigating the book. Uh, where does you, do you stand on anti-gravity research today? Do you think you would get the same results as you got back then, today, without so much stigma? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's And it's really hard to answer because I'm not investigating that field now. Um, I, as I said a moment or two ago, I sort of maintain a weather eye on it, but I'm not... Um, I'm not investigating it in the same way that I investigated the question that I posed myself in the hunt for zero point, which was, has 
the US defense industrial base cracked the secret of anti-gravity. And I really began looking at that um, in, it was the early 90s. It was probably around 92, 93. Um, I was, as you said, working for Jane's Defence Weekly. It was the premier defence magazine in the world. And it allowed me to travel pretty much everywhere. You know, I, I, there was nowhere in the world pretty much I didn't go in pursuit of my particular subject, which was aerospace. I was the aerospace editor for uh, Jane's Defence Weekly. Um, and in the course of my work, I I became a well in the course of my work I was investigating stories around cutting edge research that the US was engaged in militarily anyway particularly around stealth you remember the stealth revolution yeah. which really uh came uh to maturity in the 1980s even though much of what was um had been developed was then in secret so you know, my colleagues and I, and also um, my rivals from other magazines were very preoccupied with trying to flush out into the light what these secret aircraft were that were flying around the desert southwest of, of the United States at night um, in service. This was the stealth fighter, which came into service in 1983, but wasn't revealed to be real, to exist until 1988. So I spent a long time investigating that story and others related to it. And in the course of that experience, I began to wonder, well, what else is out there? If this is being developed, what are we talking about? Or, or what could I conjecture may have been developed in total secrecy, and maybe for quite some time. And the answer that I sort of came up with was it would probably be in the energy and propulsion arena. That would be the area of breakthrough that would be most uh, um, most suppressed, would be most kept most secret. Um, and that was really the sort of propelling thing that launched me off uh, in my quest to discover whether the United States had um, had 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 uh, cracked this secret of anti-gravity. Um, as people who will have read the book will be familiar, I, 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 by coincidence, weirdly, I still don't know who put it on my desk. I, somebody put an article on my desk which spoke of um, many companies, American companies in the 1950s, which was which were talking about developing. Um, anti-gravity as a breakthrough propulsion physics endeavor. Um, and when I read this article, I thought, what, what had happened to all of those research initiatives that these companies were talking about? Because clearly they never came to fruition. Otherwise, we'd all be seeing anti-gravity aerospace vehicles out there. It did cross my mind that perhaps a subset of UFO sightings might be secret research, uh, uh, secret, secret platforms that have been developed by the US under an anti-gravity initiative. Um, but I just wanted to go out there and find out. So I did, I, I in the course of my everyday work for Jane's Defense Weekly, I went and interviewed people and I kept my eyes and my ears open so that if anything uh, had uh, 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 sort of crossed my path in this anti-gravity field, I would then start asking questions. And that's pretty much how I did it for about 10 years. Um, the book came out in 2001, and it's hard to believe now it's 23 years old, but it is. It somehow still seems very fresh to me, uh, and I spend as much time talking about the hunt for zero point now, Pavel, as uh, I did back then. In fact, actually, probably more I talk about it now because the subject is less stigmatized now. Back then, 
in the 1990s, you couldn't breathe the word anti-gravity in the sort of company that I was keeping professionally and sort of be considered serious, you know, a serious journalist. Um, that has changed now, you know, since 2017, when the New York Times brought out an article talking about UFOs and UAP, UAP stands for um, unident unidentified anomalous phenomena, but generally refers to the whole UFO field. Um, so from 2017 onwards, I found that people were much more open about talking about the whole UFO subject, which sort of allowed me to come back to it. And we can talk about that perhaps a bit going yeah. forward. A uh, couple of things. Uh, that, that was cheeky, leaving that article on your disc. <laughs> And you don't know yeah, who it was. I don't know who did it. I, I, I mean, yeah. it, uh, it was called The G Engines Are Coming. And it showed a picture of a sort of US Air Force craft that was just hovering above a lake bed and a pilot clam clambering out of it. But I still don't know who left it on my desk. I mean, it was probably complete coincidence, but it seemed opposite to what I was thinking about at the time it was put on my desk. So, yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about synchronicities here in this conversation. I think that was definitely one of them uh, that sure. took you down the path of writing the hunt for zero point. Another aspect I think is uh, we, you know, I like to check on lists of things because I, I am a journalist myself. And I tend to do a lot of lists of the best of the worst or, you know, and in terms of aircraft, uh, I've always been curious of which ones are the fastest, you know, and on the list of the fastest ever known to the public, of course, uh, there are the two top uh, fastest were out of commission on the early 70s, which is a long time for not making any breakthroughs or advancements in terms of propulsion don't you think we have to be clear about what we're talking about when we talk about categories of aircraft so the fastest jet propelled aircraft ever built as far as we know was the lockheed blackbird uh, it was developed by the cia Originally from the late 50s, it um, entered service in the 1960s as a CIA platform. Then it migrated into the US Air Force as the SR-71. Um, that was powered by um, conventional jet turbine engines, very powerful ones. And that um, its its top speed is still classified, actually, um, but it 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 flew in excess of Mark 3.5, and it was retired in 1990. So that was the fastest jet-propelled aircraft that we know about. The Russians had some which came close, but not quite that close. Um, in terms of other platforms, yes, there were, you know, lifting bodies, which obviously would fly to the edge of space, they would um, return, they would fly extremely fast. Um, there was an aircraft called the uh, X-15, which flew in excess of Mark VI, but that was rocket powered. It wasn't a jet powered aircraft. So we just have to be clear about what kind of aircraft we're talking about. Yes, there okay. have been very fast flying airplanes and they've been flying at high speed since the 1950s but in terms of jet aircraft that was 1990 and still nothing as far as we know uh, officially that has bettered it okay thank you for the clarification um moving on a little bit uh still in the hunt for zero point uh mr hutchinson is a very interesting character uh, i've seen the videos of the hutchinson effect but i noticed um uh, for some reason, he he said he had some sort of secret sauce to what he did. Uh, what do you make of uh, your whole experience with him and what he did? 
So I was led to go and visit John Hutchison, who uh, was and is a Canadian inventor. Um, John worked with energies that he would um, trigger through the sort of complex arrangement of machinery, radio transmitters, Van de Graaff generators, all kinds of sort of electrostatic field generators. And he would tune them to produce an anti-gravity effect, or so he claimed. Um, the Pentagon was so interested in what he was doing that they sent an evaluation team. This was in the uh, early 1980s to uh, conduct an investigation, an evaluation of his work. I met some of the members of that team and they attested to the fact that they'd spent real money on John's work. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work in the way they'd have liked it to when they came up and um, set up a laboratory around his work uh, in the early 1980s. But they also told me that they thought that John, John's work was for the most part genuine. They did not know the source of his um, ability to lift objects anti-gravitationally. Uh, one of them commented to me that he thought it might actually be John's mind that was generating this uh, uh, sort of psychokinetic um, effect. Uh, others thought that it was the machinery, his equipment. But um, so there were no firm conclusions there. I suspect, though, and I'm not sure that John would admit this, but I do suspect that John's mind was heavily influential in the way that those uh in the way that he was able to levitate objects and i think there's no doubt that he did levitate objects Pe plenty of people have attested to that um you know there's also been some controversy around his work some people have said he's faked some of his stuff yeah. um i think even john has gone on record to say that he felt under so much pressure at times to uh produce a result that he occasionally did uh, and rather mischievously um, fake stuff in the laboratory, but he never intended for it to be sort of taken seriously. So, you know, John, John features towards the end of the hunt for zero point. Um, and like I say, I was encouraged that the Pentagon evaluation team that had looked into his work considered that, you know, for the most part, there was a real genuine effect there okay uh you see where uh this could lead to our eventual talk about dr jacobo grimberg because it, i think it's in some ways uh related uh to his theories uh but yeah but we'll we'll touch on that a little bit later um just one last thing about the book uh, about the hunt for zero point did you hear uh, David Grush's claims on the alleged um, Italy crash retrieval? I heard something about it. I didn't look into it in any great depth, I'm he, afraid. He mentioned that uh, it was shaped like a bell, which was interesting to me. And I immediately connected it to um, your book because of the, of, of course, the Nazi bell. And... So you haven't looked into his claims uh, to see if they're in any way connected? I haven't, to be honest. Um, like I say, I'm, my interests really are, are pretty peripheral when it comes to UAP and UFOs. Um, so uh, in regards to the bell, which I should explain for those who aren't familiar with it or, or with, with the Hunt for Zero Point, um, when I was investigating the whole anti-gravity claims that were being made around that subject, when I was investigating the hump for zero point, I was led to um, a report that had come out of Poland during the end of the Second World War, 
wherein the Nazis were said to have developed an anti-gravitational effect through a device called the bell, because it was shaped like a bell. This thing was um, positioned deep in a mine in southern Poland and um, was said to have generated this anti-gravitational effect, which had a very um, deleterious effect on people standing close to it. You know, there were reports of deaths and it broke down um, uh, uh, organic structure and, you know, such like. So um, the claims were made by uh, a researcher called Igor Witkows Witkowski and Igor um, contacted me. I'd sort of reached out to various people um, because I'd been looking at claims that the Nazis had developed um, flying saucers and the like. Um, and I went to Southern Poland and we looked at this facility where this bell device was purportedly um, in existence. And this was towards the end of the war. So late 1944, early 1945. Um, Igor was very sure in his research that this was some kind of anti-gravitational device. And it was specifically developed to be an anti-gravitational device. Um, over the years, I have become far less sure about this. I respect Igor and his, and his work uh, very much. But for my part, it seems to me that this device was in some way connected to efforts by the Germans to develop an atomic bomb, um, okay. largely under the SS. So this was this Bell device, I believe now, was used uh, for the separation of isotopes that would have led to uh, enriched fuel that would go into a German atomic bomb at the end of the war. Thankfully, of course, it never happened. But that is where my inclinations and feelings now lie. But it's still interesting to speculate. And I know that ever since that story has come out about the Bell, that it's just sort of snowballed in terms of a yeah. huge story. So uh, who knows? Yeah, first time I saw it was in a documentary uh, series in 2006. It's called UFO, I think. I don't know if you were involved in the production, but uh, it was part so. of a, a part of an episode called Real Life UFOs, where they, uh -huh. they feature the bell, but they also feature uh, an alleged um, flying saucer with the United States Air Force uh, sigil on it. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that wouldn't have been me. I it was a while back, but um, yeah. I, not me. I don't think. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, from your perspective as a former defense journalist and with your connections, what do you make of David Grush's claims? This is uh, mostly for the people at the big thing that are going to be listening. So I would like your uh, opinion on everything that's happened and what he said, and based on the people you you are connected with, uh, do you think he's legit? Do you think I I, I do though, but but I want to know your opinion. Uh, I've not met uh, Dave Grush. Uh, I know pe plenty of people who have, um, and they are people that I respect. And they say that he is on the money. This is a guy who is uh, who held a very high position um, in the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and previously, I believe, in the National Reconnaissance Office. So these are very serious, secretive. Well, the NRO is a secretive organization, um, and they. Uh, swear by the sincerity of Dave Grush and I think that there's little doubt or no doubt that he held the positions he's claimed to have held within the Pentagon that had oversight of the UAP phenomenon. Um, so uh, whilst to many people his claims would seem outlandish, I think given the sort of the general direction of the UAP 
investigation that has been undertaken by Congress on Capitol Hill over the last year and a half or so, I think we can safely say that Congress itself would have flushed David Grush out um, as uh, not being genuine if he wasn't genuine. And to the best of my knowledge, that has not been the case. Uh, people are impressed by the evidence that he's given. Um, he has encountered, of course, great difficulty in presenting evidence because a lot of it was highly classified and secret. So there are protocols around giving evidence that I know or I hear he's been frustrated by. For example, he has to give a lot of his evidence in what's called a skiff, which is a se secure compartmented um, installation. It is shielded from electromagnetic energy so that no one can listen in on what, whatever's being said. And that has been quite a hard thing for him to do. So um, I think that uh, his claims are interesting uh, and deserve to be taken seriously. Okay. And I'm going to ask you two, two points at once because I think they're connected. Uh, I've been getting up to speed on, on all the literature, uh, yours included, and a lot of uh, great investigators such as Jack Vallée or Dr. Michael Masters. And, uh, there are so many hypotheses on what the phenomenon is. And people, uh, I think that it's important for people who are not on this to realize how many decades of investigation and, and work, hard work, have been put on investigating what the phenomenon is. Out of every hypothesis that you've come across, which one is the one that convinces you the most? Or, or maybe not just one, maybe two or three? Or what's, where do you stand on what the phenomenon actually is? Well, um, of course, I'll preface this with, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> and, we can speculate. And I always say, you know, when talking about this, Pavel, that I reserve the right to change my mind because, you know, this is a very fluid field um, and new evidence is presented all the time, which um, I think should make anyone who is seriously interested in the subject, give, um, give pause for thought. And, and you know, if you, if you stick a stake in the ground and say, this is my view, I'm not going to change my view um, when you are discussing the phenomenon, I think you're going to be in all kinds of trouble because I think the phenomenon itself is inviting us to... Um, to be curious and in our curiosity to not to hold too rigid a view about it. Um, because I, every time I've seen someone hold a rigid view, it, um, it's been confounded. So my view is, is that there is no one phenomenon. It, it is a multifarious phenomenon. It has many faces. Um, and whilst, you know, it has been through different phases, there is sort of, there is the man-made aspect, you know, could it be heavily classified technology? Could it be, these are beings from other planets who are visiting us in, you know, faster than light vehicles to get here? Um, or is it something that is resident here on earth? Um, is it a combination of all of these things? I mean, the answer to these questions for me is yes, it's it's probably all of the above. The one though that I find the most interesting is the one that has sort of become more prominent over the last few years, which is that we are dealing with um, a non-human intelligence or multiple forms of non-human intelligence that somehow manifest in our reality from time to time as UFO or UAP phenomena. Um, that is not to say that those other explanations cannot exist or be possible. 
I'm sure they can. But the most interesting one for me is this non-human intelligence one. And even then, I think you have to, it, it behoves us all to keep a very open mind. Um, so what is this NHI? Does it have a corporeal a bodily form or is it an energetic um, form which manifests uh, under certain conditions in the form of the phenomena that we see? Um, again, I don't know, but I think it is interesting to speculate that this is probably um, responsible for many of the sightings that people see in that it is a phenomenon that is somehow resident here on earth already and probably has been for many thousands of years. Um, you can almost speculate since time immemorial here um, and that we happen only now or relatively recently to be confronting it in the way that we are um, and that in previous centuries, decades, whatever, millennia, um, it has manifested to witnesses in a different form, perhaps in a, in a form that they would more readily comprehend. So, you know, people like Jacques Vallée, for example, when they first started writing about all of this, I think what they should be given huge credit for is to, is, is that they deviated from the commonly held view at the time that these were um these were vehicles from other planets other star systems and speculated that um this is a much more complex phenomenon that manifests you know in in previous centuries or uh, and millennia as religious phenomena or mythical um folkloric phenomena like you know the appearance of fairies or elves or you know mythical beings that we have dismissed as ridiculous in our you know 21st century um so-called civilized worldview but i think it again it, it behoves us to keep a very open mind on what the phenomenon is and to examine it, it, yeah, how it might have manifested in previous eras um, and not dismiss those as ridiculous or hokey. That's one of the reasons I think, uh, for example, Dr. Diana Posolka's work is very interesting because she tries to blend the whole theological aspect and the whole scientific aspect of the phenomenon through her work. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that specifically do you believe in god or what what's your what's your take on what god actually is if it's uh, that okay to ask it's fine to ask um i have a a spiritual view of god uh it's not particularly conventional but um i certainly believe that there is a uh there is a numinous presence that um, transcends what we see here on Earth. Yeah. And it's probably, well, I think it's probably related to the phenomenon too, uh, in, in many ways. Do you well, agree? I don't, I don't know, um, but it, it, it could be. Um, so again, uh, I think it, it certainly pays for me to keep an open mind. I mean, there are people who uh, speculate that, um, you know, there is or may be one overarching creator intelligence and that these phenomena that we see appearing, uh, the phenomena we were speaking about just now, um, may be you know, subsets of that intelligence in the form in, in in the sense that we all are you know if if consciousness is universally pervasive and i think um yeah there are strong arguments to say that that is the case 
that it is something that does not exist purely within our skulls or the skulls of intelligent, sentient um, beings, but is something that exists outside of us, that floods all of creation and that we somehow tap into it. It is what gives us life energy, life force. It, what, it, it is what gives all living things and perhaps even immaterial, I mean, material, uh, but non-sentient things, um, a kind of consciousness as well. So that to me is probably what makes the most sense based on the evidence, but the evidence is fragmentary and we're all still evaluating it. But uh, I think it's possible to see that these, um, just as we as human beings inhabit this overarching, all pervasive consciousness reality, that there are other beings too, which have intelligence, um, which may look nothing like us. They may be energetic in form, um, but which uh, inhabit this creator space in exactly the same way that we do as well. So um, I think there is a layered, uh, I think it, it is rather um, interesting to speculate that there may be layered levels of hierarchical levels of intelligence in the universe and that we exist somewhere on a spectrum, who knows where, but we are dense physical beings. So um, I suspect that if anything like that is true, that there may be many levels of intelligence and intelligent beings above us, just as there are probably intelligent beings denser than us below us yeah that sounds logical though i've thought about that too um i wanted to ask you let moving on to what will help i think your investigation and mine as well um did you get to read some of the material about dr jacobo greenberg i did i have read some yes what did you think uh about the concepts that he he talks about yeah i i i liked his theories um they chimed with me at a level of some of the research that i've been looking into um it may not be fair to describe his theory as a holographic theory of the universe in that you know reality is a kind of hologram, um, a matrix. I mean, this is how Greenberg, uh, Greenberg describes um, the composition of reality as a matrix. Um, and in that, it is quite similar to theories put forward by uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, which I don't know whether you've read any of Edgar Mitchell's work, but Edgar Mitchell was uh, 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 an Apollo 14 astronaut. Yes. He walked on the moon. Um, and he talks very much about this, you know, reality being a hologram, a projection of information that is held at a two-dimensional level in space but which is projected as solid matter, you know, the, the, the material world that we sense and feel all around us is a projection of that two-dimensional information substrate that exists at the, you know, at, at the base level of the universe. Um, so Grimberg's sort of, uh, uh, um, retelling if you like of or, or parallel telling of that holographic matrix like composition of the material world which is in effect a uh, an illusion to us i mean it feels solidly real um but is of course illusory because our um our brains which we can perhaps begin to imagine as a more like a quantum computer 
a quantum processor which processes um, the very complex uh, energetic um, sort of base form of information that resides in the universe. Our brains, our quantum computing minds are able to interpret this in a way that we as human beings um, are able to, uh, to navigate. There is another very interesting um, theorist, uh, scientist that I follow, whose name is uh, Professor Donald Hoffman. He's at yes. the University of um, uh, UCLA. He's at UCLA, um, Irvine. Uh, sorry, the University of Southern California at Irvine. Um, and Donald Hoffman is uh, promotes this 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 view, uh, this theory that um, there are vast depth levels to existence that we never experience beyond an interface of reality that we can um, we can navigate. And um, he calls this theory his conscious realism model. And he describes it in a very neat way that I like because it's, I'm not a scientist. I need analogies in order to understand what, you know, these complex theories look like. So Donald Hoffman describes our experience of reality as existing much like a computer screen, such as the ones that we are uh, 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 viewing each other on now, Pavel. So, and on my computer screen, of course, I have icons that I click on. These help me to navigate my computer. They, they, they allow me to do what I want on my computer, but they don't reflect the interior workings of the, of the computer itself. They are representations of the inner workings of my computer. So, um, Donald Hoffman says, it is with reality in that we as conscious, sentient humans have developed an architecture um, that allows us to navigate uh, reality, giving us purely the reality that we need for our survival, no more, no less. So in effect, what I'm doing when I'm talking with you, when I'm having any conscious experience in the world, I am clicking on an icon and those icons themselves interrelate and they produce more information. And that information gets fed back into the architecture of the universe. The, the, it feeds this substrate of reality, expanding consciousness, expanding awareness. And, you know, even if we, um, I mean, I, I find it useful sometimes to speculate as well that this universal matrix in which which is teeming with information and which is being uh, fed all the time with more information through the, the feedback mechanisms that we as humans are that all living things are and even all inanimate things are feeding back information into into the cosmos into the universe well that starts to look almost like a huge artificially intelligent computer that is needing to self-learn, to evolve, to understand itself. You know, is that God or is that a giant AI computing device or is it some hybrid of the two? Well, you know, it, it, if you look at the evidence and there is, you know, mounting evidence all of the time that we live in this information-based um, universe, it 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 isn't uh, wrong. I don't think to speculate that we could be living in just such an architecture. Yeah, because uh, a lot of the work Dr. Greenberg did it, it hasn't been translated. So what you read is only part of it, and I think that I don't know if you read what he experienced with uh, the shaman Pachita. 
not directly no. him. I know that he went out and spent a lot of time, uh, a, a considerable amount of time with Mexican shamans. Yeah, uh, there's one specific shaman called Pachita. Uh, she was from the decades of the 50s and 60s and 70s. And she used to perform uh, actual surgery. But what she did, Jacobo Greenberg claims, uh, is impossible because she effectively made transplants, organ transplants, materialized stuff from thin air, which is impossible. Uh, but where that resonated with me is something that happened to me when I was 14. Uh, uh, it's called, They're called maracames. It's kind of a shaman. They're from the north of Mexico, and they do rituals with peyote. And one of those shamans visited my house and he took many of the adults uh, to a trip. And when he returned, he started doing some sort of ceremonial uh, rituals on kids to get uh, a negative energy out of them. That's the way I saw it. And when he did it to me, he did some chanting. He grabbed my face and then he told me to spit it out. And as he was chanting, I felt like something, like a tooth broke out of me. And it was kind of weird because I was like, oh, I bit my own tooth. And when I spat it out, uh, it was like a really small red uh, piece of rock. And I don't know how that happened to this day. And I felt it just like it materialized inside my mouth. That's, that's what happened. And when I read, uh, and I've been reading Dr. Jacobo Greenberg's uh, theories, he essentially says that the synergic theory allows us to manipulate reality uh, through this matrix and, and uh, through the connection between the neuronal field and the lattice, which is kind of like the, mat the matrix. Um, I think that some of the people that you've come across with are more connected to that uh, because Ingo Swan calls it the signal line, right? Well, yeah, Ingo called it the signal line, as far as I'm aware, uh, when discussing remote viewing. So for those who don't know who Ingo Swan was, um, in 1972, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States initiated what's called a remote viewing program, a psychic spying program, using people with gifts who could see across time and space to spy. Well, back in those days, it was spying on the Soviet Union predominantly. Um, and it was uh, a, a program that was founded by two uh, physicists at Stanford Research Institute, uh, Dr. Hal Pudoff um, and Russell Targ. And they employed a gifted psychic called Ingo Swan, who uh, was living in New York at the time, um, to come across to California and be their, uh, uh, their sort of, um, uh, their premier remote viewer, if you like. So, uh, I knew Ingo. Uh, I didn't know him very well, but we we had met on a number of occasions um, before his death in 2013. And he did talk about this signal line. And the signal line was something that um, was when he knew that the, the that he was um, on an information line to and from the target that he was um, zeroing in on or had been asked to zero in on by his uh, targeters, by his handlers. So um, that for me is what the signal line is. I suppose you could extend that um, signal line to be any moment where we feel that we are plugged into the matrix, you know, that information field that exists outside of our three 
four dimensional time space um, infrastructure, you know, our, our reality. Um, and Ingo himself talked about a matrix. Um, I don't know whether he'd ever read Jacobo um, Grimberg. Sorry about the pronunciation. It's okay, um, don't worry. But yeah, he read very widely. Um, he read a lot about all kinds of uh, phenomena. And um, but but the matrix was very much something that he saw as our real reality and that what we experience in three dimensional, four dimensional space time is simply a construct that has been developed either for us or by us to navigate our own physical reality. Um, so, yeah, I think you'd find that Ingo Swan and uh, Jacobo Grimberg would have been um, as one when it comes to their worldview. Yeah, and you also saw Yuri Geller bend a spoon, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, the spoon is actually behind me. Uh, it's here. So uh, this was... Um, this was the spoon that uh, Uri Geller um, bent for me and my family when we went and we I actually I went and visited him twice in I guess it was probably about 2002 or three. And uh, we went to his house. Uh, I went alone first time and he bent some spoons and we we talked about the research that I did for the Hunt for Zero Point, which is why he asked me over to his house. Um, and then I expressed uh, some sadness that my family hadn't been able to see him bend his spoons because they would have loved it. My kids were quite young at the time. And um, so Uri very uh, generously said, bring them back, you know, next time you're passing. So I came back about a month later, this time with the family, and he put two spoons, which I'd actually brought myself. So they weren't his spoons even. Um, two spoons uh, on top of each other. And he never held the spoons himself. Uh, the, the friend of, uh, a friend of my son, sons who, who was 10 at the time, um, held the spoon and Uri passed his finger over the neck of the top spoon. And both of them bent in the way that this one did and continued to bend when they were put down on the table. I mean, frankly, I've never seen anything like it before. Um, and, you know, the experience that you were relating about your, what you produced from your mouth when you uh, were in the company of that shaman. What, I mean, it was, I was as, as astounded by what Uri had done. I mean, particularly the second time, because there was no way that he could have influenced that in any other way I mean, certainly in any way that required some physical touch because he never touched those two spoons. So, uh, yeah, um, it was a fascinating experience and one that still leaves me thinking a lot. Yeah, that's that's exactly how I felt back then because I my mouth was closed the entire time. There was no way he could have introduced anything during that period. And he, he had just arrived to my house. I still can't explain it to this day. It's it's really strange, but yeah. that that that's what makes me think that uh, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Greenberg's uh, theories and Dr. Edgar Mitchell's theories have some very much true truth to them. You know, because um, I also recently saw an interview with Joseph McMonagall, who's another. Uh, remote viewer mm -hmm. and he says that we we all have the capacities that they have but they're not we just need to train we just need to practice and from all the work that i've read of dr greenberg i think this is my assessment i think that what he did was like a guide to maintain ourselves in some sort of flow state but constantly so we can 
remain tapped into that um, informational grid, you know, and I I do have a contact with people who are currently translating the rest of his work. And I think that it's going to be very beneficial for anybody who comes across it. Um, and yeah, well, uh, lastly, though, well, two two more things before we leave. I was going to ask you, how do you think consciousness and UFOs correlate? Where do you think they meet? Mm. So if the, if the matrix that we're talking about is real, I mean, is our real reality. And I think what is interesting about all of the people we've been speaking about this evening, so Jacobo Grimberg, um, also Ingo Swan, also uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, um, and others. Uh, I'm not familiar with, you know, Joe Mc McMonagall's writings, but um, I do know that, you know, all of those remote viewers considered uh, that that training in the way that you described, you know, practice um, led to breakthrough. Um, and Ingo, when we did speak, and you know, we did speak from time to time, was very insistent that this was is a latent um, capacity in us all. We all have this so-called psychic skill. It's just that most of us don't choose to exercise it. Most of us don't even think about it. Uh, we go through life, you know, in, in very much in the physical world. And we, uh, you know, we, we, we don't give any thought to our natural sort of uh, psychic um, makeup. Uh, and I use that term because if we do live in this matrix, then this is all a construct. It is a construct. I mean, everything, our bodies as well, are constructs that are rendered into existence um, in the same way that a computer program, you know, renders a picture on my computer, you know, from bits of, you know, software into a picture that I can see that is rendered into reality on my screen, the screen of my computer. Well, so something, well, what is it? Is it consciousness? Maybe is rendering uh, our experience of reality into existence around us. Um, so when it comes to UAP and UFOs, again, I don't know, but conjecturally, we can say perhaps that these beings, these entities have a more highly developed um, skill set uh, developed over millennia, maybe billions or you know, billions of years um, to uh, navigate this real reality, this real substrate and there are probably many dimensional levels to it. Now, are they able to navigate from one of those dimensional levels into others? Are they, do we see them? Do they become a physical reality when they transcend one uh, dimension into another and move through our own? Well, perhaps. Um, I think you know, what we can say is that there is plentiful evidence for the existence of UFOs and UAP. I don't think anyone is debating the reality of that anymore. Even the Pentagon came up with a, a document in 2021 saying that there is no doubt anymore that UFOs are a real thing. They are a real phenomenon. UAP exist. What they are, is a different matter. And as we said at the beginning of this discussion, there is no one probable explanation for them. There is a multitude of different explanations for them. 
but where they intersect in the consciousness domain is that we have you know multiple instances of people who um in some altered state encounter ufos you know is that altered state um is that triggered by the ufo experience the ufo um, manifestation or is the manifestation of the ufo brought on by some um altered state within the the person who is having the encounter so but the, the the fact is though there is an intersection there is a an overlap between our deeper levels of our conscious experience and the ufo phenomenon and sometimes they cross over like a venn diagram sometimes they cross over um and we experience them in our real reality you know i'm a former aerospace um i'm a former aerospace analyst you know i i i wanted this phenomenon to be a nuts and bolts phenomenon you know i wanted it to be something that i could understand in using my 21st century three-dimensional four-dimensional mind and that to me was uh or should have been ufos as solid vehicles that come from other star systems that occasionally pass through our airspace and people see them including military pilots you know that for me looked pretty real the bit that i could never square away is that these phenomena are so regular i mean it's not even as if a day goes by when some ufo report is made but not just in one part of the world all over the world so this phenomenon is happening in our airspace all the time um does it make sense that uh beings from other star systems are so curious about our uh our planet that you know not only are they turning up every day of the week but they keep coming back for more i mean that it may be that there is a subset of the total phenomenon wherein that is happening but it sure as hell cannot explain the multiplicity of all of those sightings all the time so it has to be in my view something that is um related to consciousness the way we perceive the world sometimes the veil that separates us from these deeper levels of reality becomes uh thinner you know and sometimes it falls away altogether and we see more of this depth reality than we customarily see as three-dimensional four-dimensional human beings and then we we experience these ufo uap type phenomenon a uh, phenomena um you know so i hope that answers some of your question they certainly overlap and i think they overlap in um what we you know customarily describe as our you know um our reality space that's why i think maybe shamans could be more uh prepared or wired to understand uh phenomena like this because it it's it's so there are so many variations they they shape shift they have so many forms it's it's impossible for it to be just one thing <laughs> um, yeah, yeah yeah i think i yeah absolutely I, I think last that's... one is kind of a curveball uh but my show is called psychoactivo and we do think uh we do talk a, a lot about uh the effects of psychedelics in the human mind and i wanted to ask you uh what what is your take on on these effects uh, or if you have ever uh investigated any of it uh maybe curiously just um 
what do you think about, for example, uh, the effects of psychedelic mushrooms or uh, other types of psychedelics in the human mind? Well, it's not that much of a curveball um, in that um, I, I, I haven't looked in huge depth into it, but I have spoken to people who have conducted experiments um, in the psychedelic field. Uh, I interviewed several years ago Professor Rick Strassman. I don't know whether you know yeah, of Rick, course I do. Uh, or know of him, but um, uh, Rick uh, was a professor, uh, uh, I think, at um, University in New Mexico, uh, where in he investigated psychedelics. In fact, he conducted, I think, the first legalized trials of psychedelics on um, psychonauts experiences. Uh, and uh, this was several decades ago. He wrote a book about those experiments. He'd used, I think, predominantly, if not exclusively, but certainly predominantly, a drug called DMT, yeah. which is um, a, it is a naturally forming psychedelic in, in the human body. Um, but it also has a very short duration, you know, experience, it's uh, sort of um, time span. So whereas, you know, uh, psychedelic mushrooms, where, whereas ayahuasca and various other psychedelics have a very long duration, DMT probably has a 20 minute duration. Of course, when you're in that experiential space, time stretches infinitely, you know, it doesn't exist or doesn't feel like it does. So, you know, it, it, the 20 minutes can seem endless. Um, and I also know that people who describe their experiences on DMT have um have have described quite a lot of overlap with other sort of what i would call or actually what others have described as contact modalities with these deeper realms so for example um there is quite considerable overlap between what near death experiences describe so the near death experiences are people who are brought back from um, so-called clinical death, you know, where there is no brain function anymore, um, to describe extraordinarily rich experiences that they had, quotes, while dead. Um, and they describe, well, encountering entities, encountering very richly uh, populated um reality scapes which feel of course very different from this one but they describe generally when they come back that where they have been felt more real than this reality scape here on earth um, and people who have experienced dmt as well describe very similar things it feels more real there than it does here and so I think there is overlap between some of these um, contact modalities. And of course, the psychedelic one is very interesting because to some degree we can control that one. You know, the, these yeah. other um, contact modalities tend to be very spontaneous. You don't know when you're going to encounter a UFO. You don't know, obviously, when you're going to have a near-death experience. You know, you hope you never do. Um, but... Uh, with the psychedelic experience, that is one that you can control and to a large degree. And, you know, I know that some very serious uh, universities are now, you know, conducting trials. We have Imperial College here in London is doing trials at the moment, I believe, into this space and reporting some really interesting, phenomenal results. Yeah, they started mapping up that place between different different um experiencers that's that's really interesting because it's impossible for them to know the same place in different experiences and yet they're doing that 
Exactly. And I read the same thing. And it's that's very interesting indeed. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think we can uh, pause this for now. And hopefully you can give me some more of your time in the future, because this was really, really uh, a, a wonderful experience. Uh, I hope you had a good time too, uh, Nick. Uh, where can people find you, Nick? Online. So, uh, and by the way, thank you, first of all, Pavel. I really enjoyed talking with you and I'm grateful to you as well for introducing me to the, you know, the work of Jacobo Greenberg. Um, and perhaps next time we talk, I'll be more familiar with his materials, but, you know, uh, that, that has been a, a very interesting to me. Um, people can find me on Substack these days. I'm writing my new book. It's called The Light Beyond the Mountains. It's about um, my sort of thoughts and analysis on the whole consciousness field. I'm describing it through, um, initially through my portal of expertise, my expertise being, an air, I'm an aerospace and defense analyst, or I was. So uh, that's my sort of point of entry into this discussion is, is, is in that field. But it very much moves on as the book progresses. And as we said earlier, it's a serialization. So every two weeks, I bring out a chapter. Um, and as the book progresses, it's, you know, I, I relate my experiences with people like Ingo Swan, and Uri Geller, and people like that. Um, and I sort of stitch together a narrative, this is very much a narrative based story. It's, uh, it's not episodic, it has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. Um, so I tell it like a story because I'm a storyteller. That's what I am. And um, I did the same with The Hunt for Zero Point. So if you go to uh, nickcook.substack.com, that will take you to my Rogue Icons page. That's my page on Substack. And within that, you will find um, the first three or four chapters uh, of my book, The Light Beyond the Mountains. And that's really the best way to find me these days. Um, I'm really enjoying that experience of um, putting that work together in a serialized format. So uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best way for people to come across my work. I'll leave a link in the description of everything we've talked about today. Also, I think it's very important to note that you're also offering uh, long talks with some of the people involved in the first chapters of the book. I, I'm guessing you're going to do the same with uh, future uh, names involved. Yeah, it, it's actually it's a it's an interesting you know format uh, for me again because you know I I come out of a very traditional journalistic school wherein we 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 put our thoughts down you know on page in in this format i'm able to put my thoughts down both on the digital page but also i'm able to interview as you say people who have come into the story so people who've come into chapters you know one and two i go out and i interview them we do you know a kind of podcast much as we're doing here and then i post that and um that will be sort of continuing uh, on a pretty regular basis as we go forward. Also for subscribers, what I'm offering is a chance every couple of months or so to Zoom call with me. So, you know, we can all talk about the chapters that I posted to date. It is meant to be very interactive. You know, consciousness is a subject that unites us all. I mean, we may not yeah. feel that way. We may feel that we're just, you know, we've turned up on the earth and we are, you know, bumbling our way through a material existence. But actually, you know, we need to give thought, I feel, to the fact that, you know, we live in a pretty troubled world. Actually, you know, there is war everywhere. Um, there is the threat of war everywhere. There is... Uh, a great deal of inequality um, in the world. There is, you know, an ecosystem 
emergency, which is threatening species and it's threatening the climate, you know, all of this stuff. We live in um, challenging times. And, you know, my view is that we aren't going to fix our problems on the planet by using the same mindset that we've used hitherto. Um, the 20th century was amazing for all kinds of reasons. It has given me this laptop. It's given me all the things that I enjoy pretty much, you know, in a materialist sense. But if we are going to seriously tackle some of the challenges and problems we face in the 21st century, then we need to, uh, I think, look at these challenges differently and think differently. And perhaps through a, a new lens, you know, this consciousness lens that we are, it seems, all connected, connected in a way we don't fully understand, but which science is beginning to get to grips with. And I'm pretty excited by that. You know, I think that if I can facilitate even a part of that discussion, then, you know, I've done something worthwhile. So this is why it's good that it's interactive. I'm delighted that we're speaking today. And I really look forward to the time when we will speak next time. You know, that's funny because uh, uh, I forgot to talk to you about the transfer potential experiment between Dr. Goswami and Dr. Jacobo Greenberg. And it's funny you talked about that because that experiment, I think, proves that we are all connected through our uh, minds. And I do think that the more connected we are, the less uh, disconnected from reality, from the rest of the world we're going to be. And I think that's the only way that we're going to move forward and uh, perhaps, I don't know, I think we are hide mind in a sense, but we are very disconnected from each other. <laughs> Well, we we are very disconnected, and you know, uh, I mean, it's, it's maybe we could talk about this next time. Maybe it can be our start point for next time. But um, you know, we talk about connection. Um, perhaps we should really talk about separation, because actually, and, and I think Jacobo Greenberg would have attested to this. Certainly, from uh, my you know, reading of his writings is that this 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 matrix is the all unifying one mind um what 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 is what what gives us this sense of individuality is physical separation you know we are phys i am physically separated by my body from you know the rest of the three-dimensional, four-dimensional space around me, um, which feels separate to me. It feels outside of, of me, my mind, and my body. But, you know, maybe that is the artificial construct. You know, the artificial construct is this separation of me, you, everything, from this one mind, this one mind. You know, and and it's it's by no means an original thought. Of course, it it is the wellspring of indigenous wisdom that we yeah. are all connected. That everything is from this one sort of creation source, and that um, we are separated from it by our physical selves. Um, so, yeah, I mean. No wonder we all feel connected. We feel that sort of instinctual connection. But it is so illusory. It's it, it's there one moment and then it's gone the next. You know, and I think that perhaps this is this will be the century that we discover scientifically the um the the the, the real connection that exists between us and all things and you know i really hope so because i think once we feel that way that we are all connected we're going to treat our 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 world uh, and ourselves and each other in a very different way yeah i agree with you 
oh man this was really good <laughs> thank you very much nick for your time uh oh, i hope you. we can do this again soon let's do that that'd be great yeah may i have a great uh, rest of your week and may the force be with you and with you cheers bubble <laughs>